Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome everyone to today's show, the Defenders series. Alhamdulillah, every time we try to focus on the lives and the da'wah techniques of the pioneers of da'wah, the anbiya and the righteous ones. Uh, today, inshallah, we have Brother Salahuddin Patel from the headquarters in the UK to give us some some insights, inshallah, on today's uh, on today's uh, show. Uh, and we'll be covering the story of the unknown man from the people of Pharaoh, which is mentioned in chapter 40 of the Quran. I know this is not a tafsir class, so we're not going to cover the tafsir and this and that. No, we'll be covering some gems some insights that we can relate to and we can use in today's da'wah, inshallah. Uh, welcome, Brother Salahuddin. Jazakallah khair for joining us. Wa alaikum salam, rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Jazakallah khair for inviting me. I'm really excited about today's um, session, inshallah. I hope there's a lot of gems that we can benefit from and share. Inshallah, you know, during this month of Ramadan, the month, the month of guidance, so... Alhamdulillah, bismillah, looking forward to it. Alhamdulillah, it's 6 p.m. in Toronto. I know it's uh, it's past 11 in the UK. So jazakallah khair for uh, taking time away from your tarawih, from no your family time and, and sleep time. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you for the sacrifice. I mean, I mean, no problem. Uh, the first thing that comes to mind when we talk about this man uh, from the people of Pharaoh in Surah Ghafir, chapter 40, just like the man who is mentioned in Surah Yasin, Surah 36, that we don't know their names. Their names are not mentioned in the Quran. And as a matter of fact, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not focus a lot on names and places and time. Yani, say for example in Surah Yusuf, uh, there is this big surah that talks about Yusuf alayhi salam and so many other characters in the story. They are very important, like the king of Egypt, Al-Aziz and this and that. Only two names are mentioned in the whole surah. Yusuf alayhi salam and his father. The king is not mentioned by name. Al-Aziz, the, the chief minister is not mentioned. His wife is not mentioned by name. Even the brothers of Yusuf alayhi salam, the 11 brothers, they're not mentioned by name. The youth in the cave, in surah Kaf, their names are not mentioned. Uh, and so on and so forth. This is very common in the Quran. And the whole point is, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants you to put to, uh, to put yourself in their shoes and to learn the moral of the story. What can you do if you were in their place, right? And what you should learn from them. And this is why you, you will not find a lot of emphasis on persons and their names and last names and postal code. It doesn't really matter. You know, what matters is what can you learn from them and picture yourself in their place, right? Now, uh, this is very important and I know you can relate to this one. Anbiya and du'at and ulama scholars, they need committed helpers, right? And of course, we always uh, say this when we uh, reach out to people and ask them to join and, and help with, with volunteers. Uh, the reason why Muhammad Sallallahu was successful in his da'wah, in his mission, because he had dedicate, dedicated people around him like Abu Bakr and Umar, Uthman, Bilal, Khadija, Fatima, I, all these people around him. Isa alayhi salam in many places, whenever he is mentioned in the Quran, you will see the mention of al Hawariyin, the disciples. When he called out, who is going to stand up for God with me? And they stood up and they said, okay, we're going to support you all the way. And this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, they prevailed. Uh, this is a small footnote. People always ask, you know, about the four madhahib, Hanafi, Shafi'i, Maliki, which madhab should I follow, and so on and so forth. And I tell them, subhanAllah, in Islam, we have many madhahib, not only four, right? So, you guys, I'm not sure if you heard of al Lays ibn Sa'd, wal awzai with this and that, subhanAllah, these are big names. These are like giants, like Abu Hanifa, Malik, Shafi, and Ahmed. Now, subhanAllah, we don't hear a lot about Al-Awza'i, Al-Lays ibn Sa'd, and this and that, these big, big scholars. And the ulama say the reason is because the four imams, Abu Hanifa, Shafi, Malik, and Ahmed, they had dedicated helpers. 
students who promoted their madahib. They taught the rulings, and this is why they became very popular, and they overshadowed the other imams who were as knowledgeable as these four were, right? So this shows you the importance of having dedicated helpers, people who are committed to the cause who support you. Because at the end of the day, Mustafa Khattab is one man. Sheikh Abdul Rahim is one man. Salahuddin is one man. Hamza Source is one man. Hijab, Imran. So, uh, we need to unite all of our forces so we can work together to achieve our purpose, inshallah. Your comments before we move on, inshallah. Yeah, Jazakallah Karim for that opening. Alhamdulillah, that, that's really insightful. You know, first point about where you mentioned about, you know, the, the Allah keeping those people anonymous so that you can put yourself in those shoes and really understand what it could feel like and then how you can learn from that and apply it to your life and the second point is absolutely you know in order to be successful in the dawah you know in our era what we focus on is you know motivation education and action and we really need to have in order to be successful we're able to have all of these international outreach specialists across the world because we have a team that's dedicated we need you know people from all different areas in order for us to be successful just like the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu did just like the pious predecessors and the, the prophets had helpers and supporters. So it doesn't mean, you know, when we say that we want you to get involved in that, that you necessarily have to be on the front line. No, you could be doing something simple as, you know, taking someone somewhere, picking up some uh, distribution leaflets, you know, just uh, financially aiding, even making dua, but it's like a coat. Uh, combined effort, everyone together, pulling together, and this is the A team, and this is, you know, this is the important lesson that Allah is teaching us here in the Quran. Alhamdulillah. Jazakallah khair for the insight. You know, sometimes I, you know, I have those conversations with my wife because, you know, she sees me, you know, you know, giving da'wah, translating the Quran, the clear Quran, and, you know, giving shahadas to people, and sometimes she would feel like jealous in a positive way like you know you are getting these rewards and stuff and i tell her it comes down to sincerity if i'm sincere i'm gonna get some of the rewards but if i'm not then i'm not getting anything and i told her you know you when you take care of me and the family we take care of each other when you make dua for me uh you know most of the time i make tea for the family and you know you know cappuccino for my whatever you know, I tell my wife when I'm busy and you have to make tea for me, you will be sharing the reward. The, the reason I'm saying this, you know, subhanAllah, when you assist someone with something good, it doesn't matter, you know, your role, if it's big or small, it's significant, you know. So the, the person who, like the, the person at the mosque, the, the janitor where I work, right, who keeps the masjid clean, will be sharing the reward with someone like me who gives the khutbah for Juma, oh, no. right? And I tell them in the same way, if someone is involved in something haram, yani let's say if you work with, with, with a gang or drug dealers, and by making tea for them, you will be <laughs> sharing the sin, you know? Yeah, so and fun. even when the police comes to arrest everybody in the room, in the house, even if you just make tea for them or mop the floor, they will take you along. It doesn't matter if you are with them, you are with them. And if you are in the company of du'as, even if you are making something small, sending emails, even if you are helping with administrative stuff, office stuff, you will be sharing the reward, right? Because subhanAllah, some people think, you know, you know, you guys, you sit in front of the camera, in front of the lights, <laughs> and we are there in the background, you know. No, wallah, you would be sharing so much rewards. Maybe if you have the ikhlas, maybe Allah will give you more rewards if we don't have the ikhlas, right? So, and this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not mention this, this man by name. And Allah says in Surah Nisa and other places in the Quran that I told you, Muhammad sallam, the stories and the names of some anbiya, but some others, I didn't mention their names, right? So subhanAllah, it, it's not about fame or, or gain, it's about effort, right? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who gives the reward. If your name is not known, 
the most important thing is Allah knows your name and he will give you the reward right so I hope this is a message of encouragement to our volunteers inshallah to do their best and at the end of the day inshallah the reward is secured with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ameen 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 ya rabbal alameen uh, so now moving to the story of this unknown man the anonymous man in the story of uh, uh, Pharaoh and, and Musa alayhi salam in Surah Ghafir chapter 40 and it's very powerful it talks about Yawm al-Qiyamah and it talks about the reward of the believers and the punishment of the people who oppose uh, you know the, the cause of Islam and, and so on and so forth uh, one thing that stands out about the personality of this unknown man in the story of uh, this unknown man in the story of Musa alayhi salam is that he dominates the scene so there is a small mention of Musa alayhi salam he's mentioned a few times but this man dominates like two pages as a matter of fact the story of this particular man his first mention is around ayah 26 and it concludes with ayah 46 so he dominates 20 ayat 20 long ayat in this surah so basically he is the focus it's he his story is the highlight in the surah even though his name is not mentioned uh he could not have come up with the arguments that he used against pharaoh and his people uh, unless he had the knowledge to speak so you will see him using go rap referring to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so allah exists he is one he sent the Prophet Musa alayhi salam, and this Prophet is supported with revelations and signs from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the four points of Gorab are used in the Da'a technique of this man. And mashallah, you can see his wisdom, you see his knowledge, and, and you see his, his sincerity in the way that he is he is he's speaking to his people. And and subhanAllah, uh, Brother Salahuddin, uh, throughout the his talk when he talks to the people he is calling them ya qawmi my people my own people my flesh and blood so people can relate to them he's not like an outsider who is coming to them you know to teach him he's talking to them as one of them because he cares about them and wallahi when i read this in in this story that he is mentioning his people my people my people my people throughout his dawah technique it always inspires me that when you do da'wah to someone, you have to understand the people, you have to relate to them, and you have to understand the culture of the people. So you don't sound like foreign to them. No, you have to talk to them in a way they can understand. And this is why I think the, uh, mashallah, the da'wah material of Ayira, the booklets that you guys put together, the videos, especially the booklets and the books by Abu Zakaria and the, the man in the red underpants and stuff. Because uh, before I got those, you know, uh, 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 flyers and raw material, mashallah, we used to get like some flyers from, you know, back home from other countries. They were translated, broken English. You don't know what they're talking about. They can't relate to people and and they were not really effective you know because as soon as people read something that is irrelevant or grammatical mistakes structure is very awkward or using difficult words they're going to put it down they're not going to finish it right and and so what, what do you think of this no absolutely absolutely you know and you see this throughout the quran where you know the the prophets when they're talking they're talking to their people and and, the, and the, there's a, a wisdom behind that because you know the deen is for the whole of humanity and the most effective way to sort of spread this message is to use someone from their own community to sort of so that they can understand like you know this is not a foreign religion that applies to a different people look i am one of you and you know i'm telling you this is the truth right and i am able to uh, apply this and and live by this and become a better person and so if i'm able to do that so you're able to do that as well and so it's so important in today's day and age like you said the down materials they're relevant they're contemporary they're using examples that people can relate to you know and, and connect to 
And so that's so important. And, you know, the great thing that we have, alhamdulillah, in Ayera is we have all of these du'at from across the world and we hire them specifically from their areas or they're residing in those areas because they are in the best position to go and speak to the people because you live with the people, you know how they communicate, how they speak. So we see that this is an effective methodology that's based upon what Allah teaches us in the Quran. So absolutely, alhamdulillah, we see the, the results in following this methodology today. Alhamdulillah, and this is very amazing. Remember back in 2018 when uh, you flew 15 Imams from Toronto and, and Canada, so we didn't just say, you guys, okay, we're taking over, we're going to come and, and do da'wah here. No. You brought those imams from the U.S., from Canada, other parts of the world. You give them the training and they go back, to utilize this knowledge, you empower them to go and do da'wah. And mashallah, this is a very effective uh, way of doing da'wah and utilizing those imams on the ground to uh, help their own communities because they can better relate to them. Uh, let me show you the passage here. Try to share my screen. Yes, right here. Bismillah. Can you see it? Can you see the screen? Yes, we can see the screen. Okay, that's good, alhamdulillah. So the yellow part, the part highlighted in yellow, this is what Pharaoh said. And the green part is the dawah of the unknown man. So you see he is dominant here. He's, he's talking, right? So as soon as Musa alayhi salam came to deliver the message, I'm the prophet of God. And of course, he brought them proofs because anyone can claim to be a prophet. There are so many false prophets, you know? So he came and Pharaoh challenged him and he says, if you are really a prophet, you have to have a miracle, a mu'jizah. What's your proof? You know, and, you know, the staff and the, and, and the hand and the different miracles that he performed. And of course, as we said last time, every prophet came with a miracle that suits his own people. So in the case of, of Musa, salam, the people of Pharaoh, my people, I'm Egyptian, you know, by birth. You know, they were good at magic. So when Musa salam, came with the staff and the different things, something of the same kind of thing that they were good at, and he was able to beat them. So the magicians themselves, they said, oh, wait a minute, this is not, this is not magic, man. And they submitted and they believed. Uh, the same with Isa salam, the, the people of his time, they were good at, you know, uh, medicine. And, you know, when Jesus, Isa alayhi salam, he started to heal the blind and give life to the dead, they said, wait a minute, there's something else. And the same is true for Muhammad sallallahu alayhi salam, the eloquence and the Quran and the poetry of his time. And he, when he came and he beat the poets of his time and they couldn't challenge him. So eventually many of them submitted because they said, this is something else, man. Right? So when Musa alayhi salam came with all these miracles and stuff, to prove himself as a prophet, Pharaoh said, let me kill him. He's a liar. He, so he started using, you know, propaganda techniques and the psychological warfare. He's coming to change your traditions and the legacy of your parents and so on and so forth. And he is telling them, let me kill him. He is the one who wanted to kill him. But he said, let me, allow me. I'm asking for your permission because I'm doing it for you. So this is what we call fake democracy, right? <laughs> so first of all, you cannot challenge Musa alayhi salam with proofs and arguments because he is telling you, you claim to be, I'm your Lord, the most high. This is what he said. No, I'm challenging you. I'm telling you that Allah is the one who created you the one who provides for you. And this is mentioned in chapter 20, Surah Taha and other places. What do you say about this? I'm giving you all these positive arguments to prove to you that there is, there is a God, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He exists. He created you. He provides for you. Eventually, He's going to cause you to die and He's going to hold you accountable. What do you say? to counter the, the logical arguments that I'm giving you 
Now what Ferris said, I'm gonna kill you. <laughs> what the, what does this prove to you? Salahuddin. This yeah, this just proves that, you know, he's he's lost the argument. You know, when someone um you see this a lot actually when um when you're sort of seeing people debating or having uh, conversations, when the person who's lost they they resort to tactics such as, you know, attacking the person or putting the person down or you know using um in diversion tactics you know here uh, pharaoh is using aggression say so let me kill him because he's got no response he's yes no response <laughs> to the argument he knows he's lost subhanallah so it could have been much easier for him to come up with a logical argument but threatening i think this this proved to the people around him that he is he's helpless because yeah. if you resort to violence it means that he cannot you know come up with a logical argument to meet his arguments subhanallah and 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 of course last time uh you were on the show we spoke about the uh dawa techniques of musa alayhi salam and 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 the diversion and the evasion of pharaoh and so on and so forth uh, this is a uh, propaganda technique that some yeah. people use to, to divert the conversation. So subhanAllah, and it proves to the people behind them that you don't have an argument. Uh, this reminds me, subhanAllah, of two people that were having a conversation. And one of them uh, said, uh, do you think, uh, which do you think is more important, the sun or the moon? They were having like a logical debate. So the guy said, one of them said, you know, that the moon is more important because it shines at night when it is dark. Mm. But the sun is not important because it's already bright. We don't need the sun. <laughs> what kind of logical? <laughs> the reason why we have light is because of the sun, right? But all these false arguments, subhanAllah, they don't lead to... Uh, to anything yes so now as you can see when pharaoh said let me kill him with your permission of course i'm doing this for you uh because he is trying to change your well-established cherished tradition of your parents he's talking about idol worship and, and so on and so forth he said he wants to cause corruption in the land and he is going to change your most cherished uh, tradition because he knows. And wallahi, I know Salah that uh, we can relate to this. That a lot of people, subhanAllah, you talk to them. You give them logical argument. Dalil after dalil, proof after proof. And eventually, even if your proofs are so compelling, they are so powerful. But people don't want to change because they just want to follow their parents and forefathers blindly, they don't want to change. Why? Because this is the comfort zone. They don't want to think. They just want to follow their parents and culture blindly. So wherever a, a person is born, this is what they follow. So if a person, let's say, for example, if I were born in, let's say, India, then most likely I would be Hindu or Sikh. That's it. Finished. <laughs> and it, we, we, we do the online chat, right? So let's say if I talk to a Hindu person, so basically they are born into the faith and, you know, so they start to defend it. And of course, I talk to them logically. I give them Dalil from the Quran, the teachings of the Prophet Sallam. And, you know, of course, the saying of the Prophet Sallam that every human being is born upon the fitra to believe in one God, and to be a good human being and so on and so forth. But of course, the the family and the culture, they change this, this pure nature. And I tell this person, if you were born in India, then you would have been you would not have been Hindu or Sikh, you would have been Buddhist. And you would be telling me that Buddha is, is God, not Krishna, and so on and so forth. Uh, if you were born in Morocco or Egypt, you automatically you would be Muslim because this is what most people believe. If you were born in America, you would be Protestant. If you were born in K 
Canada, you'd be Catholic. If you were born in Europe, you'd be atheist because this is what most people, you know, believe. So, subhanAllah, what Pharaoh here is doing basically, he's playing this card because he knows that people hate change. They don't want to change. Even if change would be for to the better or for the better, they don't want to change. And they say, if it's working, why would you fix it? Just keep it the way it is. Yes. So, what would your message to the people who just follow their culture or their faith uh, and they're not willing to to listen to, you know, da'wah, they don't want to engage in conversation about God, His existence and oneness and so on and so forth. SubhanAllah, I know exactly where you're coming from, Sheikh Mustafa, and exactly, you know, why this technique is so powerful. Because myself, you know, I come from being born into a Hindu family and, and being guided by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I know how strong, you know, your identity is based upon your traditions, upon your heritage, the people you look up to as an authority. So it's always going to be a compelling argument. And we know that, you know, even the Prophet ﷺ was giving dawah to his uncle. And, you know, he, they were there, almost right there. But then the argument came, well, are you going to, you know, leave the tradition of your forefathers, you know? And of course, that was such a powerful thing. He said, no, no, I can't leave, you know, because it's an emotional attachment. It's identity, it's heritage, it's all of these emotions combined. And so it's important that, you know, when you're thinking about Islam and, you know, um, you're, you're talking to people about this, that you really empathize from that perspective. You know, what would it be like if you were born, like, you know, say, I sometimes I use this example in the Dawah, that, you know, say you're a... Um, you went and you spoke to a Christian priest for some reason, you know, and it's just for an argument. And then you decided to embrace Christianity. How many of you could go home and tell your parents you've embraced Christianity? No one could do that, right? So it's no different from a person coming from a different faith, especially Islam in today's day and age. So it's important to reassure the person that, look, we understand, you know, that it's not easy, you know, your parents, your her heritage. But at the end of the day, you can't deny truth, right? At the end of the day, you're going to lie to yourself if you understand that logically and rationally makes sense that there's only one God. This God, you know, is the only one worthy of worship, that the Quran is the final revelation. It is guidance for humanity. And the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam is the last and final messenger in a long line of messengers. You come to that realization, then you're just really lying to yourself. And at the end of the day, you know, you can't deny that, you know, we're going to die. That's a fact of life. You know, like they say, death and taxes, right? These are facts of life. So you're going to meet God eventually. So you can put it off for now. So I think it's important to sort of empathize with the person, but also tell them at the end of the day, God Almighty is the authority. And also to reassure them that if you take this step, don't worry. You don't need to tell anyone. You know, you can keep it private ponder over it and understand that God is the one that's going to look after you put your hands into the you know put your trust into the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you will see that you know things will work out and you can give them many examples like all of the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu they were all reverts to Islam right and they had to uh, the, the troubles that they had with their families and even today contemporary examples you can use so it's important to show that this argument is a false argument but also to reassure the people that, you know, that um, uh, we, we are here to help and support them. Zakallah khair. I uh, totally agree with uh, sympathizing with uh, with the person and putting yourself in their shoes. I got a comment here from uh, Brother Yusuf. He's saying if uh, you can use like a headphone to uh, minimize the echo. <laughs> I Alhamdulillah. Using my phone, so I'll put myself on mic when I'm not speaking. Uh, you. you know, one thing about the people of Makkah at the time of the Prophet ﷺ, they knew that Islam is not only about taking the shahada. Because when they are asked, even in the Quran, who created the heavens and the earth and who provides for you, they say Allah. They have no question. Tawheed al like Allah is our Lord. They had no problem with that. But what comes with it is, is really what worried them. Because 
uh, you have a family, you have friends, you have work, and also halal and haram, do this, don't do this. So uh, our brothers and sisters who do da'wah, when you do da'wah to someone and you give compelling argument and so on and so forth, and you see the person hesitant, you have to understand the whole picture that this person is not only saying the word, it, it's what comes with the word that you know that matters to this person because now they see the whole picture, they know their family, their circumstances, and eventually at the end of the day, we deliver the message, we talk to them, we plant the seed, and it's up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give them hidayah. Some people, wallahi, from personal experience, you do da'wah to them, and subhanAllah, they take shahada like 10 years later. So there is no need to push anyone. You just give the logical arguments, dalil proof from the Quran, give them da'wah material, and khalas, you have done your part. And, and the Prophet ﷺ is told the same in the Quran. And as a matter of fact, other prophets are told the same thing. Your job is to convey, deliver the message. What comes after is the, the, the duty of, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees that a person is fit to be guided, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will open the door for them. If the person is sincere in the pursuit of faith and iman, Allah will guide them. But if the person is playing games, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, it's, it's in his hands. So now speaking of this man, the unknown man uh, from the people of Pharaoh, uh, subhanallah, the first thing that he said, because in the previous two ayat, uh, Pharaoh said, let me kill Musa, let's kill his own people and so on and so forth. So the, the first thing that this man said, would you kill a man for just saying my Lord is Allah? He is telling them, have you lost your mind? Why would you kill someone for just saying my Lord is Allah? And this is in ayah 28. Will you kill a man for only saying my Lord is God? He has given you an argument. You need to respond to it with an argument, not with violence. So the first thing that he made sure when he spoke is first of all to protect Musa alayhi salam. So he is basically disarming Pharaoh. Because there's no point if he goes after Musa alayhi salam to kill him and kill his people. So first of all, this man, because of his wisdom and his knowledge, he started with the urgent uh, point by dissuading or discouraging Pharaoh from killing Musa alayhi salam. So he said there's no reason to kill him. He didn't do anything wrong. He just said this statement that it's only one God. So there is no reason to kill him. Now... Uh, don't now he's telling them basically forget about the person of Musa salam, and killing him and getting rid of him. No, he's telling them look at the arguments and the proofs, the argument of Musa salam. This should be the focus, not the person of Musa salam. And by doing this, he was able to uh, protect Musa salam and his people. And I see this as a very smart move uh, from this man. So he started with the march. Uh, most urgent point then he moved to uh, proving that Musa alayhi salam is a prophet there's only one God Musa alayhi salam has Dalil and he has revelation he, so he went on to prove go rap because you can't start with go rap and there's something more urgent like protecting a human life and, and so on and so forth and this is something that we learn from Sharia that protecting the human life is the most important thing then you can move to other things after right so you can see uh, him prioritizing here. Uh, so he is saying, forget about Musa alayhi salam. Let's focus at what Musa alayhi salam is saying. Let's focus on his da'wah. Let's go through his logical arguments. And he is saying that there, is, there are two things about the da'wah of Musa alayhi salam and what he is saying, his message. He is either a, a liar or he's telling the truth. There is no other, you know, option. There is no other thing, you know. So there are only two options. He is either a liar, and if he is a liar, then he will be doomed. You don't have to worry about him because liars will end up in destruction. They will self-destruct by contradicting themselves and so on and so forth. But he, if he is telling the truth, you guys will be in big trouble. So he's using 
uh, this uh, logical argument. So what do you think of his Dawa techniques and the Gorab? SubhanAllah. Yeah, absolutely. And in fact, you know, this is, um, uh, we use a very similar argument when it comes to the talking about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Was he, was he liar, deluded, or was he telling the truth, right? Yes. And so exactly the same thing here is being used, SubhanAllah, by this anonymous man to defend, you know, who Musa is. And if you follow, you know, the argument, then it basically leads to only one conclusion. He's telling the truth, yes. right? So, so absolutely, very powerful. This is, again, part from the Gorak, Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. And you know, the ulama of tafsir, when they do tadabbur on these ayat, they see this man was very smart. And you know, this style is used in many places in the Quran, like the story of Yusuf السلام, when he was falsely accused by the wife of Al-Aziz and his shirt was torn. So the, the witness who came forward and he says that if the shirt, this is the first point that he made, if the shirt of Yusuf السلام, is torn from the front, then she is telling the truth and Yusuf is a liar. But if it's torn from the back, then Yusuf is telling the truth and she is lying. But he is starting with the point that says that the, the wife of Al-Aziz is telling the truth and maybe he is lying. He's making this point because if he said, if the first thing that he said, she is lying and he's telling the truth, they would have said, how much did he pay you? Why are you taking his side? So he started, you know, <laughs> by giving an argument for the wife of Al-Aziz and an argument against Yusuf alayhi salam. And in the same way, this, you know, this da'i, the unknown da'i from the people of Pharaoh, he is saying, if Musa alayhi salam is lying, then he would be doomed. Because if he said, if he's telling the truth, you guys would be doomed. They would say, okay, why are you taking his side? Why are you defending him? No, he is speaking about Musa alayhi salam first. He's saying option number one, if he's lying, he is self, you know, he will be self-destruct. He's dooming himself. But number two, if we prove to you that he is telling the truth by virtue of all the proofs and all the arguments that he has provided, then the only logical argument that will follow is that he's telling the truth. If you guys deny him, you will be destroyed. If you follow him, you will prevail and, and you will succeed, right? So the ulama of Tadabbur al-Quran they say that this man is very smart. He is prioritizing and he knows what he's talking about. He's not just talking like random stuff. He is diffusing the situation to protect Musa السلام, and his people first. Then he is going after the proof and the dalil of Musa السلام, uh, uh, to prove that he's actually a prophet and he's telling the truth, right? Now he moves to the next point, the logical argument that he is using, and he is saying, oh my people, look around you, right? He's now telling them, forget about Musa alayhi salam, for, forget about the staff and the stick and, and all that stuff, the miracles. He's telling them, look at yourself. You have authority. You're established in the land. Look at the palaces. Look at all the blessings that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has showered on you. Look at your ability to see. Look at your ability to hear. And, and the fact that you are free. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you so much. How do you respond to all these blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Because you evidently you didn't create yourself. Evidently you didn't bless yourself with sight and hearing. And your heart beats, the sun. and the, You didn't create these things. Who created them? It has to be Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, how do you respond to these blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? If you didn't create these things, someone else created them. What about this someone else? Doesn't he deserve your gratitude? Doesn't he deserve your worship? So we established that Rububiyatullah, that he exists and he provides for you. He created you. He gave you all these blessings. Now Tawheedul Uluhiyya. Doesn't he deserve your worship? So now he is going into Gorab and he is directing them to the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his ability and his power through the blessings and the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I think this is a very logical argument, especially when you talk to atheists. 
who let's say deny the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they say that you know this world came from nothing and it made itself and it it doesn't make sense to me like uh, I know uh, brother Salahuddin and, and the other brothers in the UK and the outreach specialists throughout the world when especially in the West you know uh, in Canada in the US in the UK in Europe in general you often time you come across a lot of atheists uh, whereas in Africa in Asia in the Philippines and in, uh, in, uh, in other places you don't come across uh, many uh, atheists in those countries so why do you think you know uh, atheism is on the rise in, in the West in developed countries uh, brother Salahuddin. Yeah, Bismillah. Yeah, yeah. As you know, atheism is 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 a growing um, belief system across the world, and it emanates from the West. And really, if you look at the history of it, there's two main reasons for it: is the decline of Christianity in the West, and secondly, the rise of sort of scientism. And it's almost like scientism has replaced Christianity as a sort of a, uh, as an authority of truth. So where, when we talk about, you know, the study of knowledge and, and where do we find truth from, they've taken science today as the yardstick for truth. So every truth has a sort of philosophical, naturalistic explanation. So anything supernatural cannot be accounted for in that understanding of a science because it's based upon, you know, the five senses, essentially, and induction. And so this is the propaganda, this is the narrative, this is what's being promoted. And then all of the ideology, all of the sort of um, understanding of how you should live your life, what the purpose of life is, you know, YOLO, you only live once. Uh, there's FOMO now, uh, which is fear of missing out, the new one that the youth are talking about. And it's all because of this idea that there is no God. We can explain things, science can explain everything. Everything has a naturalistic explanation. And then if you have that understanding, then there's no accountability, right? Without God, there is no accountability for your life, really. And so, unfortunately, this is what's being promoted in the West, you know, materialism uh, and egocentrism. Um, and it's really essentially, you know, two main things. And Allah mentioned this in the Quran, that the two things that will destroy your faith is doubts and desires. And that's exactly what they promote here. Atheism promotes doubts into the existence of god and it also promotes following your desires right do whatever you want you're gonna die make the most of it right and so unfortunately we're seeing that but whereas where we're seeing people like africa where they're less developed nations uh people uh, latin america philippines asia people are more religious they're sticking to um you know their, their sort of traditions and even their natural state because you can see they don't have this sense of being independent, you know, that they, they are so close to the natural world. They see the world, they see nature, they can see that something, there must be something greater than themselves out there. And this sort of natural living leads to sort of, you know, that, that fitra coming out. And so coming back to your point that, you know, this argument that was used exactly, that is the Gorap, the GNO really, God's existence, first establishing Allah exists. And there's no other explanation for your existence. And secondly, oh, which is the oneness of the Tawheed of Allah, that he, you know, Allah is the one that is worthy of our gratitude, thanks, worship, you know, and therefore, because Allah created us, Allah must know what's best for us in, in terms of how to live our lives. You know, there was a, a social experiment or a study uh, many years back in, in Canada. So basically this uh, researcher uh, he studied the nature of people here within Canada in two cities, Vancouver and Toronto, right? I'm not sure if you have been to Vancouver. Uh, Vancouver is one of the most beautiful places in Canada, mashallah. It's by the ocean, and I have been there. I stayed there as a visiting imam uh, back in 2013. And mashallah, you know, the scenery, the nature, the water, the trees, it's amazing, man. <clears throat> and he said that people in Vancouver are happier and they are more connected to nature and they are always smiling. They are more humble, right? And the reason is, he says in Toronto, T Toronto is a big city and I live in Mississauga, 
uh, which is, you know, it, you know, it has some, you know, green space. It has, you know, waterfront and everything. And, and the reason why I chose Mississauga is because, mashallah, it reminds me of my village in Egypt. We have the Nile River running behind my, my farm and, and this and that. But when I go to Toronto for street dawah, I'm being honest with you, I don't like to go to Toronto downtown. And all the skyscrapers and the big structures, it's like a concrete jungle. When I go there, I tell the du'at with me, the brothers, the volunteers who come with me, that I ha when I go to Toronto downtown, I have the same feeling that Yunus salam Jonah had when he was in the belly of the whale. Lost, right? So, subhanAllah, the people of Toronto, when they look up, they see these big building structures, the CN Tower, and they think to themselves, we have done something, we have created something magnificent. But subhanAllah, when you go to Vancouver, when they look up, they see the moon, they see the stars, they see the sun, they see the trees. When they look out, they see the ocean. So they are humbled by the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And, and, and this is why, subhanAllah, this is one of the reasons why people in uh, so-called underdeveloped countries, the third world countries, they're connected to nature. They can see trees, they can see, you know, the creation of Allah around them. So they are more religious uh, from personal experience. They're more religious. But here, subhanAllah, we created, you know, this. We created the internet. We created Clubhouse. We created uh, Netflix. We created all that stuff. We feel we're something. Why do we need God? Because we can create all of this stuff. We don't need God. This is what, you know, a lot of people think. But subhanAllah, many people become religious when they reach a certain age. So they start to slow down and reflect on their life. Where am I going after I die? You know, subhanAllah, especially these days with the coronavirus and the lockdown, you know, people used to deny a God <clears throat> they can't see. But now they're scared of a virus <clears throat> they can't see. <laughs> so we are being humbled, subhanAllah, by this, uh, by this tiny virus. Some people... They become more religious and more spiritual when they have a, uh, you know, personal trauma in life, when they have a difficulty in life, when they go to jail, when they fall sick, when, you know, they're about to die, they go for a surgery, they become more religious. Because you cannot really fool yourself at this point of your life. Before that, you are distracted by dunya and the materialistic life, but now when it you come to this point in your life and you're going to meet God, God forbid, if your surgery fails and you die. Or let's say if someone dies of natural causes because they're they're old and, and something, you, you cannot fool yourself anymore. And people become wise and they start to think about where do they place their foot? Because what happens if you die and there is actually a God? Let's say it's a 50-50 chance. Then let's say you're a Muslim and you believe in God. And you believe in Muhammad as a prophet. You believe the Quran is the revelation of God. Go rap. And God forbid, I'm just saying for, you know, the uh, from for let's say I'm playing the devil's advocate, right? And I die. There is no God. There is no Jannah, Jahannam. There is no afterlife. What did I lose as a Muslim? If I lived a decent life, I gave charity. I told the truth. I was always good. I honored my parents. I was a good person. What did I lose if I lived a good life, but there's no reward in the next life, and there is no God, there's no Akhirah? But let's say I'm an atheist, and I believe there is no afterlife, there is no Jannah, Jahannam, and I die, and there is an afterlife. <laughs> what do you think, your reflections, Brother Salahuddin? So you as a Muslim, you got nothing to lose. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And yeah, you know, again, at the end of the day, people, um, you know, really need to seriously think about this at the end of the day, because there can only be one reality. There can't be multiple realities uh, where human beings, you know, uh, we're the same, we occupy the same earth and the same universe. So the creator and the reality must be the same. So 
that's a you know really good question that you ask there like you know if you're muslim and you did all of the actions that islam prescribes for you which are good for yourself and good for society and there is no you know what what it says then you, you know you haven't lost anything but if you're on the atheist on the other side and you disbelieve in god or you you know associate partners with god then you know that's it you're doomed forever forever you know how can you compare forever till you know a, a finite life which is very you know um, minuscule in in comparison you know and so again you need to again i think when that you know when you're in that natural state like you said um in nature it brings out this natural side of you which is to be spiritual to try and connect to something greater than you when you have instances where you're in a calamity you know uh, that again comes out again as you get older and death approaches you get a bit more wise and you know the sort of illusions of life disappear the glitz and the glamour they're not what they seem so all of these things are there designed for us to try and you know reflect upon the signs of allah actually and um i would just like to say unfortunately i will have to leave now because i have another live stream but it's been a fascinating fascinating journey today jazakallah khairan um please continue listening to sheikh mustafa khatab i'm sure you got some amazing gems to conclude this on but yeah jazakallah khairan for inviting me may allah bless you may allah reward you for all of your fastings and keep up the good work and keep us in your du'as inshallah jazakallah khair brother salahuddin may allah bless and protect you and your family see you um, next time inshallah inshallah ramadan <laughs> mubarak assalamu alaikum so as we're saying some of the ulama, some of the scholars say, subhanAllah, show me one thing that Islam asks you to do that is bad for you. Think about fasting. Is this bad for me? A lot of atheists, a lot of non-Muslims, they fast for physical reasons. But we do it, yes, for the physical reasons, but most importantly, for the spiritual reasons and the spiritual benefits of it. If you pray, if you give charity, if you help the poor and the needy, if you honor your parents, if you're honest when you tell the truth, I as a Muslim, I'm doing this because I'm expecting the reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'm doing this because I care about the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I worship the creator and I honor the creation. And show me one thing that Islam tells me not to do that is good for me. So if Islam says, <clears throat> don't drink alcohol, do you think this is bad if I don't drink alcohol? If Islam says, don't smoke weed, do you think if it's bad for me if I don't, if, if I don't smoke weed? If Islam says, don't eat pork, do you think it is bad for me if I don't eat pork? So subhanAllah, every single thing that Islam teaches, it is for a wisdom, it's for a divine wisdom, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling you, do this because it's good for you. He's telling you, avoid this because it's bad for you. Subhanallah. And a lot of people have come to Islam through this door. I have a friend from St. Catharines here in Canada, and he is one of the editors of the Clear Quran. And he said, <clears throat> before he became Muslim, he started to look into different religions. And he said, you know, I'm going to read the scripture because if there is a, a a a religion or a faith you have to look at the scripture the divine revelation of this faith and try to put into practice because god does not talk nonsense he has to talk common sense and the teachings have to be practical and he said he went into different faith trying to understand the teachings and also trying to put the uh the commandments of the faith into practice. So he tried one faith for a month, and that was the plan. He would try a faith for a month. It didn't work out for him. Either the teachings didn't make sense, or either the uh, the commandments, do this and don't do this, they were not practical anymore, or and so on and so forth. And he would move to the next faith, then the next faith, and the next faith. Eventually, when he came to Islam, he was in France at the time, so he started to pray, give charity, honor your parents, be good to your fellow human beings. And he says, this is this is amazing. This is common sense. And subhanAllah, he ended up accepting Islam. 
and he ended up uh, editing the, the Quran, the clear Quran with us. MashaAllah. So Islam is all about common sense. If I were to sum up Islam in one word, I would say common sense, hyphenated, right? The teachings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran and the teachings of the Prophet ﷺ, they make perfect sense. And they have solutions to all the problems that we have in our daily lives, as we mentioned in the story of uh, Yusuf ﷺ. So uh, you will find teachings about social life, how to conduct yourself, how to interact with someone from the opposite gender, uh, family dynamics, how to conduct politics, uh, economics, how to live your life, how to live a dignified life in this world, how to deal with people around you. Islam is a complete way of life. And imagine this complete way of life was revealed to a man who lived 1500 years ago in the middle of nowhere, no civilization, nothing. And subhanAllah, the teachings of the Prophet ﷺ and the teachings of the Quran, it doesn't matter what your level of education is. If you have a PhD, if you are a doctor, if you are an engineer, no matter what your field of specialization is, there is something that you learn from the Prophet ﷺ. When you read about economics, Islamic economics, when you read about politics, when you read about social life, when you read about spiritual life, Whatever your field is, there is something that you can read and learn from the Prophet ﷺ and from the Qur'an. And this is something amazing. That till this day, the Qur'an and the teachings of the Prophet ﷺ, they are very influential in the Muslim life. They are not obsolete. They are not outdated. They are practical and they, they are relevant to all times and all spaces. So now, going back to the story of Pharaoh and this unknown man from the people of Musa alayhi salam, from the people of Pharaoh, he became a believer with Musa alayhi salam. Pharaoh looked, looked around and he saw the pyramids and he see, saw the obelisks and all these big monuments that they built. And he said, dude, we have done something. Look at the palaces, look at the temples, look at the pyramids. We have done something. And subhanAllah, when you read in the ayat, in uh, Surah 40, uh, in, uh, here in the ayat, ayah 36, Pharaoh said, when he couldn't come up with an argument to meet the argument of Musa alayhi salam, that there is only one God, he created everything, he provides for everyone, he is the only one that deserves your worship, Pharaoh said, Haman, and Haman is basically the chief architect for uh, Pharaoh. He used to work for Pharaoh as the chief architect, and, and basically, nobody knew historically who Haman was. And this was unknown to the previous generations. And subhanAllah, it, it's mentioned in the Quran that Haman was the chief architect. And that was his title. Basically, Haman is the chief architect. Just like Pharaoh is the, is the title of the ruler of Egypt at the time. So it was only about 200 years ago when the Rosetta Stone was found in Chamb uh, Chambillion, the guy who deciphered, he was able to decipher the, the, the writings on the Rosetta Stone. Eventually, uh, there was a great breakthrough in Egyptology, and they were able to decipher and to translate hieroglyphics, the uh, ancient Egyptian language. And eventually, they found out that Haman was the chief architect, and that was in line with the teachings of the Quran. This knowledge was not known before. So Pharaoh said, okay, build me a high structure so I can go up there and look up and see if the God of Musa exists or doesn't exist, even though I'm sure that Musa is a liar and God doesn't exist. Right? SubhanAllah. And it's amazing. It's amazing that every time someone is proud of something. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala destroys them because they are arrogant. Allah would destroy them with the very thing they were very proud of and they were very arrogant because of. So Pharaoh, he said in the Quran, in other places, uh, look at the branches of the, the river. Look at the streams of water that are running through my kingdom. He said, look, 
at all these streams, the branches of the Nile River that are running through Egypt and so on and so forth. And at the time of Egypt, historically, there were different branches of the Nile. Now we have two, uh, Dumyat and Rashid. You know, this is like the, the Nile River. So you have Dumyat and, and you have Rashid, these two. In the past, before they built uh, the dam in uh, Aswan in Egypt, they used to have so many branches and the flood and, and so on and so forth. So basically, Pharaoh said, look at all the water that is running through my kingdom. So subhanAllah, what happened? He drowned. The very same thing that he was proud of, eventually it became the tool for his destruction. When you look at Korah, who was from the people of Musa salam, and he became very arrogant because of his wealth, because of his money, and so on and so forth. And he said, Inama ala ilmin indi. I'm a smart guy, I'm very knowledgeable. And look at my wealth. And he became arrogant because, because of his wealth. And eventually Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah 28, Surah Qasas, فَخَسَفْنَا بِهِ وَبِدَارِهِ الْأَرْضِ We caused his palace to swallow him up. So his palace and his wealth swallowed him up and he was destroyed because of his wealth, the very same thing that he was proud of. When you look at uh, Shaitan, Iblis in the Quran, when he was arrogant with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and he said, I'm not going to make sajda to Adam. He is created from mud. I'm created from fire. There's no way in the world I'm going to make sajda to him. Dude, look at the angels. They are higher than you in rank. They were created of light. And still they made sajda to Adam as, as their way of showing respect to uh, the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They were not worshipping Adam. And in the same way, the brothers of Yusuf alayhi salam and his parents, they made sajda to him. They bowed down before Yusuf alayhi salam to show respect, not to worship him. In our faith in Islam, in the Sharia of Muhammad وسلم, we don't make sajda to anyone. We only bow down to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We don't bow down to another human being. So Pharaoh was very arrogant because of his you know, origins. He, he was very racist with Adam alayhi salam. And he said, no, I'm not going to bow down to him because I'm created from fire. He is created from mud. And we are told in the Quran that shaitan will suffer in hell because of his arrogance with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why? Because he was arrogant because of his origins, fire. He will be punished in the fire. So subhanAllah, this is very common in the Quran. If someone says, oh, look at me, who are you? I am this, I am that, you know. So subhanAllah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will destroy them with the very same thing that they became proud of and arrogant for. So uh, subhanAllah, uh, continuing with the story of uh, this unknown man from the story, of Musa alayhi salam in chapter 40. Uh, as you can see, I highlighted here with the arrows, with the red arrows. So you see here one, ayah 29. This unknown man is saying, Oh my people. Ayah 30, Oh my people. Ayah 32, Oh my people. Ayah 38, Oh my people. Ayah 41, oh my people. Several times he is talking to them because he cares about them. He is telling them, you have this prophet who came with logical arguments and he came with the miracles to show you that there's only one God to worship and he is not a liar because of this and this and this. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed you with so much. You need to be grateful for that and you need to direct your worship to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not these Powerless, powerless idols who cannot help you and who cannot defend you. And he is telling them, let's see if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala were to take away the blessings and if he were to destroy you, do you think that Pharaoh can defend you? He is saying basically no one can defend you, not Pharaoh, not your powerless gods or idols. It's only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who can protect you. So he is giving all these you know, uh, logical arguments and rational arguments to prove that there's only one God. He exists. He is worthy of your worship. Musa is a prophet. He's supported with evidence. He's supported with proof. He's supported with the miracles. And this is why you need to believe in him. 
And he is saying basically, Allah is your Lord, not Pharaoh, who falsely claims to be your God. And he is saying that Musa السلام, didn't come up with something new. He is not faking. You guys, fellow Egyptians, you know that Yusuf السلام, lived here generations and centuries before Musa. السلام. He was a prophet. Many people followed him and they believed in his message, his message of Tawheed. When he rejected the belief in multiple gods and he promoted the belief in one God and many people believed in him. And he said how despicable it is in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you should worship somebody else and reject all the proofs and all the dalil for the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the existence of Allah, the prophethood of Musa السلام, and his revelations. And again, this is the da'wah technique that Ayura uses. The uh, belief in the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, God, that he is one. Uh, Muhammad وسلم, is a prophet and he's supported by revelations. Go rap, Godhood, the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, his existence and that the fact that he's one. And Muhammad وسلم, is a prophet and the revelations of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Go rap. So this da'i from the people of Pharaoh, he's using the same techniques and he's saying that it is despicable. It's illogical that you reject all these rational arguments for the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that Musa is a prophet, even though he came up with so many proofs and so many dalils. You guys have no proof to back up, to support what you're saying. You have no proof or argument to challenge Musa alayhi salam. So Pharaoh responded, first time Pharaoh, this is argument. I only show you, I'm telling you only what I believe, and I lead you to the path of guidance. Okay, just empty words. His second argument, oh Haman, build me this structure so I go up and look and I'm sure that God doesn't exist. What are these arguments, man? They don't make any sense. So Pharaoh gave these two responses. Then, this unknown man from the people of Pharaoh, he didn't stop at that. He just went on. He stood his ground. He's going at it. And he's saying, oh, my fellow people, follow me and I will lead you to the actual way of guidance. Not the way of guidance that Pharaoh is talking about. No, I'm going to show you the true way of guidance. And this is the way of the prophets, the way of Musa and the way of Yusuf السلام, before him. So Musa السلام, didn't come up with something new. Because all the prophets before him, they said exactly the same thing. There is only one God. He is worthy of worship. Don't worship somebody else. And he said, all my people, this worldly life is just a fleeting enjoyment. Life is very short. Eventually you're going to die and you're going to stand before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for judgment. The eternal life. So don't waste the eternal life for the fleeting enjoyment in this world. And he went on to say, Oh my people, how do I invite you for salvation to believe in God with all these local arguments and you are inviting me to the fire? You are inviting me for my doom to be destroyed if I deny Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he's telling them that these gods that you are inviting me to worship, they are powerless, they are helpless, and they cannot even respond to you today when you look at these statues around you. When you talk to them, they don't respond to you. They don't have ears that they can listen with. They don't have eyes that they can see with. They don't have hands that they can function with. They don't have feet they can walk with. They, can, they don't have hearts and so on and so forth. So basically, he's telling them they are just pieces of stone. They have no life. They cannot respond to you even if you cry out to them for help or aid, or assistance, they will not respond to you. And these arguments are used by the Prophet ﷺ at the end of chapter 7. He's using the same argument against the, the, uh, the idol worship at his time. And subhanAllah, there's a hadith in Bukhari, when Uqba ibn Abi Mu'ayt, this guy, who was one of the fiercest opponents of the Prophet ﷺ in Mecca, one day the Prophet ﷺ was making sajda, so this man brought junk and he threw it at the Prophet ﷺ and he started to choke the Prophet ﷺ. This is like in the early stage in Mecca. 
And Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu, he came rushing, he pushed Uqba away from the Prophet sallallahu and he, he said to him the same argument that this unknown man from the people of Pharaoh used against Pharaoh. And he said, would you kill a man, meaning Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa for saying that my Lord is Allah? Is this the reason why you're trying to kill him? Can't you have a civil argument with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa You're trying to kill him because you cannot meet his logic with logic. You, you're just using violence against him. So he, he used this argument to bash him. And this is mentioned in the hadith in Bukhari. And at the same, uh, you know, at the end of his logical arguments, he's telling them, the day will come when you guys, will st you and I will stand before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. فَسَتَذْكُرُونَ مَا أَقُولُ لَكُمْ وَأُفَوِّدُ أَمْرِ إِلَى اللَّهِ You will remember what I'm telling you now. When we stand before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for judgment, and I trust my affairs to Allah, because He knew that they are not going to leave Him alone. And they say in the books of Tafsir, they tried to kill him several times, but eventually Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saved him because he trusted his affairs to Allah. And eventually the response of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala came in ayah 45 after 20 verses of arguments, right? So God protected him from the evil of their schemes because they tried to kill him and Pharaoh's people were overwhelmed by an evil punishment. They were destroyed, they drowned, and eventually Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, as soon as they drowned, as soon as they were overwhelmed by the waves, you know the story when Musa alayhi salam split the sea, and, and you know the story. Musa alayhi salam and his soldiers, they drowned, and as soon as they died, they ended up in the fire, in their graves. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, they are now exposed to the fire in their graves morning and evening and on the day of judgment and when the hour will be established, they will be exposed to the fire and they will be punished. And the ulama say that this is a dalil, this is a proof uh, for the existence of the uh, punishment and the reward in the grave. And subhanAllah, ayah 47 and ayah 48, Pharaoh and the elite of his people, these you know, chief deniers, were opposing Musa alayhi salam, they were persecuting the believers, they were persecuting Musa alayhi salam on judgment day, they would be crying for help, they would be running away from each other, and subhanallah, the weak, those who followed their leaders blindly, they would be crying and they would be reaching out to their leaders in the fire, and they were telling them, we followed you, you had no argument, but you guys convinced us with your force, with your power, to follow you, so we followed you blindly, so now stand up for us, do something to protect us, we were following you blindly because we put our faith in you, stand up and say something, and subhanAllah, they will not be able to defend them, and the arrogant will say, ayah 48, we are all in it, we're all in this together. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has passed the judgment with all fairness, and we, just like you, we are here in the fire, we cannot do anything. Whereas Musa alayhi salam, those who believed in him, and this man, and subhanAllah, they say that this man who made this uh, beautiful argument to support Musa alayhi salam, some of the scholars say that this is the same man who came from the farthest part of the city. The, his story is mentioned in chapter 28, and he came to defend Musa alayhi salam and to tell him to you know run away eventually because uh, Pharaoh is going to kill you and so on and so forth. This is what some of the scholars say, Allahu A'lam. Uh, so we can benefit from the lessons of this man in this surah, his logical arguments and his steadfastness, his patience, his wisdom, prioritizing his da'wah techniques and, and so on and so forth. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, to give us beneficial knowledge and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to gather us together with the prophets and the righteous on judgment day. And inshallah, I'm going now to open the floor for questions and answers. If someone has a question, inshallah, uh, we have a few more minutes. Uh, let me see in the chat if someone has a question, inshallah. Yeah, I don't see, uh, I don't see any questions uh, per se. They're all comments. Uh, Jazakallah khair, uh, brother Ismail. Rawiyah, Sister Rawiyah, Brother Tamimi, 
Brother Yusuf, Sister Rawia, Rayan, Ismail, uh, Lala, and many, many, many other Badal uh, for your comments. If we have a non-Muslim or someone who has a question, inshallah, please, uh, you can ask. I'm going to stick around for a couple of minutes, inshallah. If not, then we'll conclude with uh, dua, inshallah. It's almost time for, uh, uh, we have a little bit till uh, Maghrib, inshallah. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless and protect you and your families. Uh, I don't see questions. So again, my, uh, my advice to you, inshallah, read the Quran. Try to learn from the giants, the prophets, and the pioneers of da'wah in the Quran so we can learn from their technique. And as you can see from my sessions and the sessions of Sheikh Fahd Tasneem, and that there's always an emphasis on Gorap in almost all the sessions. All the prophets use the same technique. There's a God, God exists, this God is one, the prophet is supported with revelations because he is from God and so on and so forth. The go rap that we use at Ayyura to prove uh, uh, to prove Islam, inshallah. And this will, will be a good foundation for uh, your da'wah. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept uh, your fasting in the month of Ramadan, to accept your prayers. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us all the best in this life and the best in the life to come. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us sincerity in everything we say and do to keep us on the Sirat al-Mustaqeem and to guide uh, people through us. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us ikhlas and sincerity. Uh, we hope to see you next time, inshallah. Please go to our website. If you are if you can volunteer and uh, get the training, the Gorab training to be able to do da'wah, to join our uh, team, inshallah, to, uh, to help with the da'wah effort as a volunteer, to help with the online chat. Alhamdulillah, go to our website, ayira.org. And inshallah, uh, register to be, to get the training. If you don't have the time uh, or the training to, to do da'wah, at least you can support our effort with your donations, inshallah. Go to ayira.org. Uh, here in Canada, you can go to uh, ayira.ca uh, and slash donate, ayira.ca slash donate. Uh, to donate, inshallah, for this cause, you can donate from your zakah and sadaqah because this is a good cause. And inshallah, it's the cat eligible, and this will help the effort, inshallah. So at least on Judgment Day, when we stand before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if you didn't have the time or you didn't have the knowledge or the training, at least you had the money. It costs one pound in the UK to print a copy of the clear Quran, a beautiful copy like this in the UK, with just one pound. That's less than a cup of coffee, man. And this can help us a long way, inshallah. So make sure, inshallah, before the end of Ramadan from your zakah, sadaqah, go to ayira.org. Or if you are here in Canada, go to ayira.ca and make a donation, inshallah, from zakah, sadaqah. And the reward is multiplied in this month. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, to give us the best in this life and the best in the life to come. Ameen, ameen, ya rabbal alameen. And for those who are asking about a good translation of the Quran, again, uh, I recommend my translation. There are so many other uh, ones, but uh, this one is 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 a good tool for dawah. It's made with non-Muslims in mind. It's easy, accessible, and so on and so forth. And for more uh, dawah materials, you can go to our website, inshallah, or you can go to ayira.org, or you can go to onereason.org. There are free dawah material. You can read them to empower yourself to be able to uh, present Islam with logic uh, and with rational arguments, uh, with compassion and wisdom. And this is the way of the prophets. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling the Prophet وسلم, at the end of Surah Yusuf, Surah number 12, this is my way, the way of Islam. I invite all to the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with basira. And basira means knowledge and wisdom and insight. So we hope to see you next time, inshallah. Jazakallah khair for watching. والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته